Thank you, sir. Welcome and good evening. I'm Bill McDowell. I'm the chair of the Center for Architecture Louis Kahn Memorial Committee. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 30th annual Louis Kahn Memorial Talk. The Center for Architecture is pleased to continue this wonderful remembrance and the rich legacy of the educational and architectural leadership of Louis Kahn. His work and teaching had an enormous impact on generations of architects and continues to this day. We could not be more pleased than to honor this legacy tonight with a talk by Lord Norman Foster, one of the world's leading architects. Thank you, Lord Foster, for accepting our invitation and welcome, Lady Foster. We are pleased to have you both here today, along with your daughter, Paola. I would like to start out by thanking our sponsors. This event would not be possible without the generous contributions made by the companies listed behind me and in your program, all of whom have supported the Khan Memorial Lecture for multiple years. These organizations believe in the importance of good design and the improved quality of our built environment. Thank you. I would like to specifically mention our lead sponsors this year, Liberty Property Trust and Comcast. Liberty Property Trust has been building the Philadelphia skyline and the Navy Yard for over 40 years. They have a nationwide portfolio of buildings and are one of the nation's leading developers of high performance green buildings. We thank them for their continued commitment to the Center for Architecture and the Khan Lecture Series in particular. Comcast has been one of the strongest economic influences in the city of Philadelphia in the last quarter century. Their commitment to the city has already produced the tallest building on the Philadelphia skyline. And now, as we will hear about tonight, their continued commitment will produce one of the most ambitious and exciting developments in the city's history. The Center for Architecture salutes this company. I would like to personally thank Brian Roberts because without him, we would not be here this evening. Thanks, Brian. We all thank you. Thanks also to Karen Buckholtz, who in the 25th hour of her day found time to help me organize this evening. Thank you, Karen. This event benefits the Charter High School for Architecture and Design, founded in 1999 as a legacy project of the AIA Philadelphia chapter. We'd like to share a short video with you of the great work taking place in this unique Philadelphia institution. arts education in the heart of Center City and at the foundation of a revolutionary way of learning. We are taking shape by drawing shapes with an old-fashioned pencil and paper. We carry our portfolios next to our books, we take our classes in studios, and we learn our art from those who practice it. Chat is where 3D computer models are extracurricular activities and the usual curriculum gets a facelift. How do you say paintbrush in Spanish? It's drawn the same in any language. We put creativity first and university acceptance letters in our windows because we forged a new path to higher education. We are designers, we are architects, we are artists, we are innovators. We are Chad. I think, I think we have a few students from Chad here and if they could please stand and be recognized, that'd be great. I think I see a few of you guys over there. Thank you to WHYY, our media partner, Chris Satulo, the Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue, is here tonight and will conduct a discussion with Lord Foster after the talk. Please use the note card that was handed out to write a question you might have, and volunteers will be roaming about to pick them up. A quick note of thanks to the staff at Foster and Partners, Comcast, and Liberty Property Trust who helped with this event and the exhibition, which is now on display at the Center of Architecture. And now, to make the introduction of our honoree tonight, I would like to introduce John Gattuso, the Senior Vice President and Regional Director of Liberty and National Development for Liberty Property Trust. John has been an advocate of good design for 25 years. He is the client that architects dream of. John.
Well, I'm not sure where to go after that introduction, uh, but uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, it's my pleasure to really welcome all of you to the 2015 uh, Louis Kahn Memorial Award and Talk. And I'm especially pleased to have the opportunity and the privilege of introducing Lord Norman Foster, tonight's speaker. In January of 2013, Liberty Property Trust, together with our partner Comcast, began a process to select a design architect for a major office hotel mixed-use project complex at 18th and Arch Street, what is now known as the Comcast Innovation and Technology Center. For Brian Roberts, Karen Buckholtz, and for me, the selection of Foster and Partners in July of that year really began what has become for all of us an extraordinary journey. Working closely with Lord Foster and his team, the vision of a high-performance urban complex built around the concept of a vertical uh, loft has evolved over the last past uh, 12 or 18 months. It is an effort to reimagine the very nature of the workplace. It is a place where things will actually be designed, well, where they will be in invented, and where they will be prototyped. It will be a workplace which will compete head on to attract to Philadelphia the best engineering talent from around the world. It is clear from the very first moment that you visit Foster & Partners Thames Bank Studio that Norman has created a design practice which is truly differentiated and truly extraordinary. You are surrounded by talent on a grand scale, over 1,400 people, including some of the most capable young designers from around the world. On our project team alone, they hail from Croatia, Australia, Taiwan, Italy, Germany, Spain, and of course the UK and the US. Notable also is the, high, uh, is the highly integrated use of technology, including both film and video, as well as 3D printing, all of which is deployed in the practice of architecture at an extraordinary scale and, and remarkable in its, in its breadth. One has the overwhelming sense of a practice which is in the vanguard, and which has been in the vanguard since its founding in 1967. I would suggest that the scale, the design rigor, the vitality of the firm in and of itself is undoubtedly amongst Lord Foster's greatest accomplishments. The body of work of Foster and Partners is well known. The HSBC Tower in Hong Kong, really a breakout project for the firm in 1986. Comer's Bank Tower in Frankfurt. The Gherkin in London. The Reichstag building in Berlin. And the extraordinary Grand Court of the British Museum. This just names really the very top of the, the iceberg, the very uh, tip of the iceberg, really, on what has been an extraordinary body of work. The firm is part of a consortium which has been commissioned by the European Space Agency to develop 3D printed structures on the moon, from which I'm sure one day, with the appropriate telescope, you will likely be able to see the new circular foster designed headquarters for Apple in Cupertino, California. Right. And I believe herein lies Norman's brilliance. It is his amazing level of energy and the breadth of his intellectual curiosity it is his ability to move from future habitation on the moon to an appreciation of the most nuanced elements of Philadelphia's industrial design heritage. Be it the end woodblock floors, which one would have found throughout the factory lofts of the city 100 years ago, or the streamlined aluminum rail car shells pressed for so many years by the Bud Company up on Red Lion Road, Norman has the ability to draw upon an unquenchable curiosity in the world around him to arrive upon exquisite design solutions. And he has the ability to do it over and over and over again over his long career. In the midst of all this great productivity, I must also admit of being in awe 
of Norman's ability to maintain a balance between work and family. I could see this so clearly last September during our visit to Universal Studios Florida uh, to look at new, new video technologies. Uh, Norman brought along his beautiful family for the visit, and I, uh, my 15-year-old daughter, Mariana, was along as well for the trip. Mariana still tells the story to her friends about riding the new Harry Potter ride with Norman and his children and watching the fire-breathing dragon appear to devour the world's greatest living architect. Uh, <laughs> by the way, an extraordinary ride. If you haven't been, you should, you should check it out. Right. All of us at Liberty and Comcast are truly excited to bring this latest tower by Norman Foster to fruition. I believe it, it may very well represent uh, one of Foster & Partners' tallest buildings realized to date. I am confident it will be judged amongst his best works. It will certainly be a new landmark for which Philadelphia can be proud. I, will think, I think you will definitely find the next hour to be exhilarating. It is my sincere privilege to, to introduce Lord Norman Foster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it would be true to say that we are, all of us, products of influences. Those influences could be individuals, they could be places, they could be objects, memories, could be conscious, subconscious. Um, and for an architect and myself, they're the lifeblood of architecture, of design. And, um, and if it's a place, then Philadelphia ranks as one of those influences in my terms as an architect, and I owe a great debt to Louis Kahn. And, um, and so really, tonight, I'd just like to talk on the subject of influences and relate that back to some projects, some of the ones that John mentioned, so I think it's appropriate to start with Lou Kahn. I remember coming here in the winter of 1961 when I was studying for a master's at Yale, meeting Lou Kahn um, and, um, and visiting his, his buildings. And if it's true to say that he was and still is a powerful influence in terms of myself as an architect, then he was also subject to powerful influences from somebody who also had an office here in Market Street, and that was Buckminster Fuller. And, um, and arguably, one of his greatest unbuilt projects was also influenced again by Buckminster Fuller. And if I show alongside that unbuilt project here in Philadelphia, our own Hearst building in New York, then the affinities are, in a way, there to see. But of course, everybody builds on those influences and somehow translates them into something which is uniquely personal. So those buildings were unmistakably calm, but they had, in turn, benefited from uh, from his contact. And if Winston Churchill made the off-quoted remark about buildings shaping individuals, then for certain, Lou Kahn's building shaped my background when I arrived here in America in 1961. And on the top floor of this building was the master's class, because temporarily we did that course in, in his building. So again, that's a very powerful link in my terms. There were three individuals at Yale. There was Paul Rudolph, and there was no conversation unless there was an architectural drawing or a model. There was Sir Chemayev, the European, and there was no conversation about a model or a building. It was purely intellectual. Why should you be doing that building? Is it appropriate? And then there was Vincent Scully, who would put 
the buildings of the day and the past and the future into a wider context. And it was he who said of the Richards Laboratories here that they are amongst the greatest modern works. Not exact quote, but that was the, the spirit. But of course, Lucan in turn was influenced by his travels. So there is a direct connection between the towers of San Gimignano, his painting at the time of his travels. So that is, a, again, a link from the past into the modern age, inspirational. But then, as Vincent Scully would be able, like a good critic or historian, a scholar, to be able to open your eyes to your, 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 your thoughts, to understand the inner philosophy. And perhaps his most enduring legacy, not only the architecture, but that philosophy of the concept of articulating and giving form and meaning to the hierarchy between those servant spaces, in this case, in the laboratories, which in 2008 became a national landmark. So the servant spaces of mechanical ducts, escape stairs, elevators, would serve the served spaces. And then the composition of that would become that extraordinary moving work of modern architecture. And at the time, I remember making this project as part of the master's course, and this was for an office building that would wrap around a corner. I think that the brief, the brief was based on Paul Rudolph's work for the Blue Cross building uh, in Boston at the time. And again, the influence here, you can see very, very clearly at the junctions, the expression of the services excuse me, go back, the structure and the office spaces which are clear and free. Um, if I move on in time to our work on the Hong Kong Bank, then uh, for me the fascination with the making of things, if you like the nobility of manufacture, not fashionable, but also the expression of structure as a way of giving order to a building. And that comes forth in the, uh, in the Hong Kong Bank headquarters. And again, um, the space, the servant space is completely clear. This was perhaps a reinvention of the uh, high rise building, the skyscraper, because it took the central core and it dissolved it into smaller elements on the side so that the space became completely free and flexible. This had enormous social benefits as well as commercial benefits in that it became, because of those free spaces, which incidentally had great views across and through, so there was a kind of interior spirit about it, but it also enabled the bank to be able to incorporate a dealer's floor in a high-rise headquarters unheard of um, before that. And the, this building was a response also to the infrastructure of the city, the pedestrian network. So it lifted it above the pedestrian level and encouraged a movement through underneath the building to create a civic space. So you could look down on that space and in turn those below could look through, uh, in effect, the shop window to banking, to the banking hall. And that interest in the infrastructure of a, of a city, the uh, arguably the connections, the public routes, the, um, the ports, the terminals, uh, the way in which the infrastructure becomes the urban glue which binds the individual buildings together. And I took this photograph as a student in the late 1950s. And, um, and again, it's been inspirational, even in terms of the way that the public domain, the public space, uh, the civic areas can uh, occupy the roof of a building. And this was something in the Reichstag that was not a requirement. We brought that along with the story of sustainability, creating a building which was zero carbon, zero waste. So in a way, we amplified 
the client's ambitions, the, the ministry, uh, the politicians. And, um, and that building has become, in a way, a sort of symbol of a reunified uh, Germany and the city of, of, of Berlin. So in that sense, highly symbolic. And one of several explorations in the way that one can create lightness um, and light and, and also the unspoken desire for the transformation of the Reichstag in a way to lighten, to lift the burden of history. And, um, and the wrapping by Jean-Claude and Christo, again, was highly symbolic before the, uh, the transformation started. So in those series of structures that would dissolve mass, would create bubble-like um, connections with the sky and light, whether this is the great court of the British Museum or the Kogod um, court in the Smithsonian in, in Washington. And it was the, um, the critic, Luis Fernando Galeano, and also Rainer Bannum, who said, I can sense two parallel directions in, uh, in our work. And, um, and with a passion for flying, and in a way using any excuse to introduce flying machines into a conversation about architecture, because for me there is a very strong connection, having been uh, a passionate uh, aviator and still fascinated by flight. Um, you could see in the uh, Bell 47 on the left the expression of structure, and on the right in the Bell Jet Ranger, the expression of a skin which envelops the structure and creates a kind of streamlined form. And the juxtaposition here of the Bell Jet Ranger and the Sainsbury Center as that, um, as that expression of a skin which will create um, a reflective exterior and give it an identity and be able to admit light and have a very, very high level of, of, of insulation. In a way, the connections with flight, and particularly um, the, uh, the soaring, the ultimate solar machine, and I've been privileged to fly many different kinds of, of, um, of aircraft, helicopters, and, and sailplanes, but perhaps the sailplane, which is in the end about light and lightness and the sky and reading the sky because those cumulus clouds mark the upcurrents. So in a way, you survive as a glider pilot. You soar vast distances by your ability to be able to use the intelligence that those clouds are communicating. And in a way, I think that that, um, that desire to have a contact with nature to be able to experience the changing moods of light and weather and connection and the ecological benefits that follow from it. And here is the interior of the Sainsbury Center and also communicating that passion for the way that things work and the manner in which you can create full-size mock-ups. So uh, as far as possible, you reduce the element of surprise at the end of the building process because you've gone through the rigor of, of mocking up full-size parts of the building. And here we have uh, Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury uh, viewing some of the early studies on, on vitrines, which led eventually to this interior where the roof is a, is a kind of instrument for being able to close up and create a dark interior depending on the contents which are contained um, and to be able to adjust to the, uh, to, the, to the climate and the seasons. I put this in as a kind of timeless reminder that when we talk about technology, it's important, I think, always to realize that technology is not a means in itself. It's a means to social ends and that at the heart of any building, it's about the needs of people, whether those are needs that you can quantify and define materialistic in terms of keeping warm when it's cold, cool when it's hot, keeping the rain off, um, but also those issues that you can't quantify, the spiritual ones, 
Also, this diagram is a reminder of something which never changes and is an absolute constant in the creation of any building. And that is whether it's the Sainsbury Center, the role of the patron. And the best patrons are those who are demanding and who are prepared to work hard for the cause of the project. And of course, in terms of the Comcast project, that is Brian. And it's impossible not to talk about Brian without talking about the wider team and John with his very uh, generous uh, introduction. So, um, so to talk about the project, I'm going to use something which was created at the beginning of last year. And this is a film that we made to show how it would work within the skyline. And you can start to see a lot of the elements that I've described, whether that's public space here coming through the transition to be able to ascend to the Comcast lobby, but with very important connections below ground, and also the way in which the vertical circulation is split to create an axis and clearly expressed on the outside in the same way of those servant and served spaces. So it's a vertical campus and it's probably the equivalent of a high-rise Silicon Valley in terms of the audience and the industrial activities of research that take place within it. But it's also a mixed-use building. And again, this axis, very, very important, which goes through to the church and the twin tower next to it. Um, and incidentally, it was Bob Stern who made the connection between that Yale project and the Hong Kong Bank as the architect of the adjoining tower. And so the importance of communal breakout spaces, a variety of space. So this is not a typical office building. It's very much, we heard earlier, about innovation and flexible loft-like spaces, uh, very much in the industrial tradition. And for the workforce uh, teams, uh, young, who will gather together at the meeting point, a town hall which is created at the junction between the workspaces and the hotel which is above it. So again, a response to a new set of needs and in a way in continuing that industrial tradition of, of Philadelphia. And here getting a feel for the hotel, the extent to which that can also, with a sky lobby and, ref, and, um, uh, and restaurant, at the pinnacle of the building. So again, the expression of, of verticality and, um, and in a way dissolving the mass of a high-rise building into something that would have a very, very clear, distinct identity, could not be confused uh, with another building. And um, if, I, if I move on to the way in which that building will integrate into the infrastructure of the public spaces. And it was quite interesting, before uh, we were appointed as architects for the project, I remember walking with John to the site, and we walked from the downtown, which was alive, full of life, with activities at the sidewalk. And as we got nearer the site, it became more bleak. And I remember having this conversation and saying, it's really important that we bring the sidewalk to life, that there is life at the public level, not only, bring, not only connecting with the subway system uh, below. So looking at that prime public space and then looking at the facades, the long facades, and again, those two clear expressions of the structure of a building coming down to the ground, connecting the tower with the ground plane, and then the lower building with its own identity and a connection here back to, again, an earlier fascination with the industrial process and, um, and the Bud Company. And uh, long before I ever became aware of Comcast, in a way, the, the, uh, the products of this pioneering company with, um, with their connections with the revolutionary Chrysler airflow car of 1934, or the new generation of lightweight streamlined trains of that period 
are inspirational in all kinds of ways. And I believe there is a kind of subliminal connection there with the quest to achieve um, the performance of a building and some of the qualities of those great innovatory uh, vehicles. So, for me, I cannot put in separate compartments the world of objects, of cars, aircraft, locomotives. And, um, and this uh, photographer, O. Winston Link, who chronicled the last age of, uh, of steam, really brings together those, uh, those three elements in a great celebratory way. In the same way that if I think about um, inspirational objects which surround us as a family, again, I get as much pleasure from the uh, propeller of a DC-3 which my wife gave me as a birthday present, as, as I do from the, uh, the Brancusi. And it was quite interesting that um, the, the Brancusi, uh, Loiseau, um, uh, of, uh, of the early 1920s, I think it was at the Paris Air Show of 1914, that, Duch that, 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 that Brancusi with Duchamp um, visited this air show and saw the polished propeller of an, of an aircraft and turned to his, uh, his fellow artist and said, this is it, this is the end of sculpture, this is the ultimate sculpture. And I, I really can relate to that. So, um, so the 19th century, the 18th century birth of a society that would uh, encourage arts, manufacture, the making of things and commerce I find that absolutely inspirational. And, um, and for me, I protest the, uh, the separation of high culture and making of things and research and, and, and commerce. I think it's a great celebration and I think it has very interesting links into, uh, into this city. So I think it was in 1754 that that society was formed and then uh, in 1774, it moved into a custom-designed headquarters, um, uh, renamed the Royal Society of Arts for the encouragement of art and, um, and commerce. And, um, and it was out of that, the patrons and the members of the Royal Society, that through Henry Cole, Queen Victoria, um, and Prince Albert, that the Great Exhibition was created. And that, again, is another inspirational influence. And it was also a powerful influence, that society, on Benjamin Franklin and, um, and Dr. Thomas uh, Hood. And it was in, uh, in London that they were inspired, and Dr. Hood, to create, uh, through the encouragement of Franklin, the first hospital in the United States, which is the hospital here. And, um, and that hospital was extended over time, over the centuries. And in the early 19th, uh, in the early 20th century, the rotunda, this rotunda, was, uh, was created by Wilson Eyre, the very fashionable architect of the day. It was designed in 1912 and it was opened in 1915. And um, an extraordinary uh, structure, and that has been in many ways, the inspiration for uh, a project, a new project in its very early stages uh, here, um, uh, the patient uh, pavilion for Penn Medicine, which you can see here, is next to, this is the exterior view, and takes its cue from the circular form of this building as a neighbor. But there's more to say, really, about this building because, um, the, the true achievement was in this space and the space above where the reception was held earlier was the creation of one of my heroes of all time, Raphael Gustavino. And, um, and he was a miracle worker. We researched his, um, the technical aspects through some research and finding the drawings uh, for this building. And, um, and he would make the, as you can see, the most beautiful form spanning 90 feet here 
and totally eliminating the need for columns. So that ability to do more with less, to create high performance and very, very beautiful uh, structures, highly economical. So uh, if it wasn't for Rafael Gustavino, you wouldn't be able to see me clearly. Many of you would have your views blocked by columns all over the place. And this building would be much taller because it would have five foot of steel sitting on top instead of a very beautiful cupola which lets in the, the natural light. So um, celebrating heroes, um, I think it's appropriate to move to the conversation with Buckminster Fuller in the, uh, in the Sainsbury Center. Again, very much in that tradition of doing more with less. And, um, and this building was um, uh, inspirational in terms of creating a light-filled, uh, kind of joyous space made possible by underneath having all, if you like, the servant spaces that would feed and make possible the space above. And that created um, eventually was the model for completely rethinking, reinventing the airport terminal. This is not so radical perhaps now, the idea of natural light flooding in and open clear spaces, a kind of analog building in a digital age because you could see the aircraft outside, you'd had contact with nature, also with the weather. Um, but in 1991, this was much more typically the image of, a, of an airline terminal. So those ideas, we developed them further over Hong Kong Airport and then Beijing Airport and a new generation which is now following it. But this is really the airport at an epic scale. This is um, 13 million square feet. It stretches two miles. It was built in five years with a workforce of 50,000 uh, people. And, um, and the train station, which connects it directly with uh, downtown Beijing, is again a light-filled concourse, as is the main, um, the main space with its internal train. So although this is a vast building, it's important to compare it, not with another single building, but to compare it with, say, a Heathrow, uh, or a Kennedy, where there are a multiplicity of individual terminals and you have to move from one separate building to another. So in that sense, it's a much more sustainable, much more human, and despite its vast scale, a compact uh, building. It's also linked into the influences of color, the roof of the, uh, of the Forbidden City. So although it is on a site which is arguably without context because it's hedged in with runways and taxiways, there is nonetheless a cultural context. In the same way that if we talk about context and I move the scale and the locality to a tiny building in the Bordeaux countryside, and that is a new addition to the estate of Chateau Margaux. And Chateau Margaux, with this extraordinarily beautiful uh, building conceived in 1815 by Louis Coombe. And at the time, he saw this as being the jewel. This is the protagonist. And around it is an agricultural estate, agricultural buildings devoted to the production of wine. So when we were tasked with the exploration of how you might create a new winery. Margot is known for its esteemed red wines, but the white wine, they really want to lift that to the same level. So it creates a new winery. And rather than compete with the protagonist, um, we opted, I felt it was important to do a continuation of the agricultural village. So I kind of scrambled around the ruins of the estate and discovered that there were enough tiles to be able to recycle them to create another building in that agricultural tradition. And you will not, from this distance, be able to see which is the new addition, unless I do something like uh, kind of ring it with a, a red circle. Um, and that is absolutely deliberate.
it is a background building. It's only on closer examination that you realize that it is different, but different in a rather special way. And another inspiration from nature is the image of the tree with the kind of spreading branches which reach out and, and create a canopy. So here, the structure is a series of trees, overtones perhaps in the curves with Art Nouveau, again, subconscious influences, but touching the ground very lightly. So this roof, which continues that tradition of the big agricultural shed, again, an interest in uh, what Bernard Rudolfsky would have called architecture without architects, a passion uh, that, I, that goes back to my own student time when I would measure, as measured drawings, great barns and farm buildings. So here, a glimpse of the connection with the vineyards belong, beyond uh, transparency, and, um, and again, the parallels between the steel structure and the, uh, and the trees of, of, of nature next. If the context moves from a Bordeaux vineyard to a New Mexico desert, then again, how do you fit into that terrain, into the countryside? How do you pick up the colors of the desert? And for the first commercial spaceport for Virgin uh, Galactic, create something which is, in turn is evocative of flight. So again, this is a very contextual um, building. And, um, and if the location moves to something that is virtually a kind of lake as a site, um, if the site is so uh, poor in terms of its bearing capacity, because it is still quite close to being a lake, how do you create something in the tradition of that quest for light and lightness that will be as close to being a bubble as you can, uh, can achieve. And the, this quite recent project, the result of a, an international competition for a new airport for, uh, for Mexico City, uh, here you can see this is, um, this is about one mile in, in length. It's a major airport, uh, it's not on the scale uh, of Beijing, but it seeks to redefine the nature of, um, of a terminal. So it questions the horizontality of a structure that will be a roof, the verticality of uh, walls, and the separate structures which reach out to connect with the aircraft. And it seeks instead to find a kind of poetic lang language that will dissolve everything into a series of free-flowing, connected um, uh, surfaces, and that will redefine some of the uh, preconceptions. For example, uh, spans in a typical airport are about 120 feet. What if you stretch that to, say, 500 feet? What if you sought to do something that would soar to 150 feet internally. Well, this film, as a simulation, is very recent. Um, it's as recent as last Monday, um, <laughs> because last Monday morning, we were working with this as a design tool with a session in London, and our sessions on this project move around. Sometimes they're in Mexico, sometimes they're in Madrid, uh, and sometimes they're in London. But here you get a feel for this almost animal-like uh, presence and the extraordinary sculptural forms that, um, uh, of this skin and, and structure. Rather than uh, use static images, I'm going to move to a kind of uncut film, which is really to evaluate some of the successes at this particular stage of design and some of the problems. So it just, again, it's a design tool, and it gives you a feel for what it might be like to drive into uh, this airport, and, um, and um, a kind of flavor of the internal spaces. 
So here we're moving under this great canopy, we're transitioning into the public spaces. The skin is still being developed in terms of the extent to which it's solid or transparent. The forms are coming down funnel-like that will channel the, the water. The light is being controlled. It's very much about movement and, and maybe it is also in a collaboration with the Anthropology Museum might contain artifacts so that it blurs the edges between the retail activities, the cultural activities, um, and, um, and again explorations of how structures might form within the overall shell. So again, very much for that quest for light and lightness and identity. The moving to a completely different context, and this is Silicon Valley, and seeking to um, combine a center for creative innovation for Apple that might also dis rediscover, um, as Steve Jobs put it, when uh, when he was young, he could remember that this was the fruit bowl uh, of the nation. And, um, and perhaps one could rediscover a landscape. And, um, and therefore, this building is set in 176 acres of trails, jogging trails, bicycle tracks, um, and, um, and is a building that lives and breathes and the traditional landscape of asphalt and parked cars is replaced by uh, mostly underground parking and really bringing back uh, to nature. But it is interesting that in popular terms, this building, which as a very large building, is about one mile in circumference and the internal diameter, excuse me, um, yes, diameter, is, is three quarters of a mile, is again the ultimate compact building because it's bringing all 12,000 people under one roof, connecting them instead of spreading them over the site um, in typically what could be 15 to 20 separate uh, buildings. So it's liberating the site for nature. But it's, it has been uh, dubbed every time I read any article about this building. It's always about mothership, spacecraft, liftoff. Um, so when it gets its planning permission, you know, it sort of lifts off and construction starts. So it's always those analogies. And it is quite interesting that, um, that, that my other uh, interests, influences, Alexander Graham Bell and his circular tetrahedon kites and some of the futuristic visions of communities in space take this kind of circular form. And coming back to that critic, uh, Luis Fernandez Galeano and his magazine, Architecture Viva, um, it was some time back that he came up through uh, a colleague of his with this cartoon which somehow the Hong Kong bank becomes a kind of uh, vertical assembly building for NASA and the Barcelona Tower. Something's gone wrong, excuse me. Um, and, um, and even the Sainsbury Center becomes part of that kind of space uh, assembly. And, um, and the object is, uh, objective is to go to the, to the moon. And little were we all to know at that particular time of the, of the cartoon that through our work on uh, 3D printing um, and pioneering that, uh, at that time we were the second largest user after, after Nike and working with univers universities led to our being approached by the European Space Agency. And working together we have been uh, developing uh, and using the closest to the dust on the moon. I think that it's here, performance and lightness is the absolute essence. Um, because I think it's, a, it, it's a, to, to move about two pounds of material is about 300,000 
dollars. So when you're looking at it and you're running, you, the, the, there is a direct, more than ever, co-relationship between, uh, between weight and cost and performance. So we made this little film to try to tell the story of how you create an environment that will sustain human life in, um, in a climate which will go from plus 100 degrees centigrade to minus 170 degrees uh, centigrade. And, um, and it trades on some of our past experience going back to the 1970s of um, inflatable structures. And it's around the inflatable that this is uh, this 3D printer. And it's learning from research into bone structures cellular structures from animals and humans. And what they're doing is they're mixing the glue, the binder, with something called regolith, which is moon dust. Again, so if this as a dwelling gets impacted by meteorites, which move at about 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet, um, then it's a very, very deep, soft cushion. And the machinery which has been hoisted up there can repair that and um, so in terms of solar radiation this has sunlight all the time it's on the southern part of the moon Shackleton Bay and um, and so this as a project is truly for real in terms of the experimentation uh, in vacuum chambers and using volcanic dust which is the closest you can find on earth um, to uh, to regolith And um, coming to the end, John mentioned an iceberg. He wasn't to know that I'd actually show an iceberg. Um, but I make the point really that the tip of the iceberg is the built building. And unless you really are in the know and immersed in the day-to-day -day activities behind any project, then what you don't see is the huge, dedicated team effort, the energy, the long hours, the kind of blood, sweat, and tears that goes into the tip of that iceberg. And also, you can use that as an analogy and say that the, to make the tip of that iceberg, to make a building which is legible and seems so obvious, so simple, um, then that doesn't come easily, I assure you. And um, I'm always, uh, because I don't think I could function as an architect if I, aside from, uh, from the warmth and support of my family, the kind of zen-like away from it all of getting on my bike or strapping on a pair of cross-country skis. So somehow I always connect uh, those performances, whether it's my own amateur level or whether it's at a professional level. And that ability of an athlete to make something seem so simple, to see a cross-country skier going up a near vertical slope, almost like a ballet dancer, or the cycle rider here finishing in that incredible sprint, you know that there are thousands and thousands of hours and training that has gone into that. But if I relate this back to my personal world of cycling and very long runs with friends, and cycling is very much about the peloton. And the peloton, a kind of French description for the pack, um, that enables the collective team to go behind the, uh, the guy out in front who, like the, um, the bird, the head of the V formation, is making it easier for the pack to go faster. So they're conserving probably about one third of their energy. And, um, and it is that as a group working that makes possible the achievement of that um, end quest, which might be the greatest sporting performance or the best possible building. So I'd just like to pay tribute to my peloton, my colleagues, and all of the supporters, the patrons, the collaborators, the builders, um, everybody who is a party 
to those projects. I'd like to say thank you and thank you. If my volunteers would help collect cards up and down the aisles, we will take your questions uh, for Lord Foster now. I'll do a very brief introduction. Of course, in your programs, you'll see we have WHYY's Chris Satulo here uh, to help uh, moderate the discussion with Lord Foster. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And thank you, Lord Foster, for that uh, far-ranging and invigorating talk. Uh, let's uh, thank him again for that. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And I'm afraid it was so far-ranging that every question I had planned for you, you already gave uh, an answer to. But so we're going to uh, cover some ground again, if you would. I thought maybe we should start with the Comcast project and talk about that a little bit more. Uh, how do you uh, think of this building, this tower, being in dialogue with the Stern Tower and other buildings in Center City, Philadelphia? How have you thought through that? Well, I think um, it's got several really um, interesting stories. And um, I, 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 th I think the first thing is that this is a building which is connected to an extraordinary network of public transport. So if you're talking about a sustainable city, a sustainable building, you're talking about the infrastructure and the connections. So, um, so good public transport and access is absolutely fundamental to that. And here, there's a tremendous investment in that connectivity and seeking to demonstrate as a kind of manifesto that those experiences below ground don't have to be miserable experiences. They can be, you know, they can be uplifting. They really can be uh, part of the, uh, of the architecture. So a tremendous amount of, of effort is going into those below ground spaces. And it's quite interesting. I mean, in the very short space of time, uh, within uh, one talk, if I, if I was just talking about the project alone and nothing else, then I would really be showing how you could go from a train and eventually find your way through into the public spaces and the way in which the internal routes could take you a shortcut through the building, how you can connect with the, with, with, with the hotel. So that is... Um, I think, uh, a very little-known story of the, of the project. And the fact that it continues um, a kind of past tradition, not of making things, but making possible the innovations and the discoveries that will lead to the making of things. So um, in no way to uh, diminish the importance of administration and offices. This is, um, this is very much a, a, an, industrial, uh, an industrial building. There's a series of, of, of lofts stacked one on top of the other. And perhaps in terms of sustainability, mixing different uses within one building is a good story. So the incorporation of the hotel and destination points at the top and base of the building and the town hall in the middle is all about encouraging movement. So in that sense, it's almost like a, a city in, in microcosm. And um, although there is a formal axial relationship between the existing Comcast Tower, they're very different in terms of what is happening uh, within them. So I think the, the dialogue is enjoyable in the sense that one is one typology in the sense that it is a central core within the, the, the heart, and that is a um, uh, 
perimeter spaces around that central core looking out in, in all directions and that the internal organization uh, is very different and is coincidentally and quite helpfully if we're talking about the context of Liu Kang, there is a, a very real expression of the separation and the differences between those vertical movement spaces um, and the loft-like spaces which are very, very flexible. So I cherished your image of the peloton, which is very evocative. Can we talk a bit about the team that is working on this building? How large is it and how do you give it a charge? How do you give it its charge? And then what's your... Well, the core of the team is sitting over there. So <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, I can't ask. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's, just a, uh, it's just a great team. I mean, there's um, the, the, the Nigel, Dancy, Russell, I mean, they're just fantastic individuals. Um, and, you know, we all come together as a kind of collective. And because we have invested so much in, um, in research, then uh, we call upon a, a, a very wide range of skills. So in the practice, there are 140 separate disciplines. There are 77 uh, different languages, 44 different uh, nationalities. And I think it, it was Nigel who, on the Mexico airport project, noted that, in the, the, that there is one team, and it's composed of two practices, um, our collaborators, Fernando Romero in Mexico, and ourselves. And we come together, as we did on Monday morning, um, and, and we work as one team. But if, if just to answer your question, mm -hmm. if we separate that out, on Mexico airport, on that competition, 97 individuals participated. Mm -hmm. And of those, 23 were, were architects. Mm -hmm. So it is a truly a kind of multidisciplinary uh, group. And even if we are not responsible for the structural engineering, and there are fantastic structural engineers involved on this project as, as, as collaborators, we still have an input on the structure from our own uh, engineers. So it's as we're still working in the direction of holistic uh, design. So as a practice, it, it is still evolving. So in your talk, you give a sense of the, the somewhat dizzying variety of projects you have going, you know, in terms of their scope and their geographic reach. How do you manage your day? And how, and how much time and how do you engage with all the projects? How do you make sure they're going in the direction that you want them to go? Well, a lot of those projects are built and, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it is in the nature of architectural projects that some of them are lightning fast, but many are quite long haul marathons. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were taking stock last week of where we, where we are uh, and where we're going. And, um, and quite regularly, a number of projects, and this is not true of Comcast, I'm delighted to say, because we're all kind of have a great sense of urgency and impatience. But, but many projects go over 12 years, 10 years. And, um, and that, um, to, to keep, that for those teams, for all of us to keep sharp over a long period like that is, um, is close to the marathon experience. Right. As you saw at the top in uh, Bill McDowell's introduction, um, the event tonight benefits the Charter High School for Architecture and Design here in Philadelphia. Chad, we have some I thought students. that was a great presentation, yeah, incidentally. Yeah. So we have the students from Chad here. Um, would you like to give them some advice that they'll remember for the rest of their lives? No pressure, <laughs> but... Um, I was asked that question recently mm -hmm. um, by uh, an interviewer from the Louisiana Museum. And, um, and it, I was completely taken kind of off guard by the, by the question. Um, but, but, but just spontaneously, I just made the point that if you're really excited about architecture, about design, um, and um, you're so excited by it that you want to live it, every waking minute mm -hmm. um, and you're totally, um, almost totally absorbed by it, then great. But if you're not, there are so many other creative activities. Mm -hmm. My advice would be 
to, to find something else. Mm -hmm. or, to, <laughs> or to celebrate it by, by being driven by it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you talked quite a bit about uh, your love of aviation and how it works into your work, but one of the questions from the audience is asking you to speak a little bit more about how that passion for aviation has influenced your work over time. Um, I think that the, some of the craft of, of aviation, and I've probably flown from my logbook about 75 different types, um, uh, sailplanes, which I singled out, um, are probably the ultimate kind of uh, spiritual experience. So I think that contact with nature and the way in which the flying machine interacts with nature and in a way the pleasure of being able to adjust the trim and the controls um, and to be at one with nature um, is at the same time very demanding but very satisfying and, um, and at times in moments of almost blind panic when it doesn't work out the way that you hope it will you say oh, what the hell am I doing here I mean or you know I'm paying for this or whatever um, so I think that um, the any profession has um, if you're really immersed in it uh, you have the satisfaction um, but you also have, um, you have the downsides, it's a, it, it's a balance. And um, so I find aircraft, flight, lightness, light, nature, if a building is working with, with nature, um, and, uh, and arguably the most sustainable buildings for a future where energy is more scarce and more precious and you want to make the maximum use of it, then you need to learn from those buildings in the past before an age of cheap energy when in a desert they were able to create cooler environments or in the Alps or the polar regions they were able to create environments which were more comfortable by being warmer. Uh, so I think there are important lessons to learn from those buildings and if we incorporate those lessons using the technology of our age because at any point in time, it's been maximizing the use of the technology of that age. So we associate, I think, in a rather arrogant way, the idea that technology is something of our age, is something new. I mean, technology brought man out of the cave. Uh, the first boats were high tech. Um, so, so for me, there are all kinds of profound connections between being aloft, um, and, and, and I think it's, it's a kind of primordial urge. I think it's what drives kids to put one block on top of another until it falls over, of people to climb mountains. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's more than just creating verticality to achieve density, and mm -hmm. that's not in any way to diminish the importance of that as well. Mm -hmm. A question from the audience. Uh, to what degree does it feel to you that the fraternity of architects who operate at your kind of global scale, does it feel like a fraternity that is appreciative and to what degree does it feel competitive? Do you feel, do you feel driven to exceed um, something else? I'm competing so, against myself every day. Yeah. If I get on my bike, mm -hmm. I time how mm -hmm. long it takes me to get to the mm -hmm. top of a hill and I know when I'm sometimes more fit or less fit. So. Mm -hmm. I think Do you have a Fitbit now? Are you using that piece of technology? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's, um, in a way, you do what you, what you do. I think you, you, I think we would, all of us, really like to believe that if we do something well and we create um, a place, a space, an environment, which is in some way better, which raises the quality of life, then you are seeking to make a difference. And, um, and I think it was Buckminster Fuller who used the analogy of the trim tab. And that was the trim tab being a small control surface, which would make it easier to move the larger control surfaces. So uh, perhaps if by uh, an example of a building which is um, 
zero carbon, zero waste, then maybe that points the way to a, an architecture of sustainability in the future. So I think that um, if you're not competing against the clock or you're not competing for a competition for a project, I think you're, you're if, to try and keep sharp, you're, you're trying to better performance. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think that that brings me full circle back to the analogy with, um, with machines. It's human endeavor. Mm -hmm. I, think that, uh, um, I think that competition is, a, in a way, a lifeblood. Mm -hmm. A few people in the audience uh, would like you to talk a little bit about your design for the Reichstag, which one person called masterful. And sort of you're thinking of how you were trying to get that project to represent uh, a birth of democracy in Germany. Well, it's quite interesting because we, the first round of the competition, which was an, um, largely anonymous, but then 14 architects were invited to join that otherwise anonymous group, and, and nobody knew who was competing. And um, this was at the beginning of the process of reunification, and ambitions were very, very high. And, um, and we succeeded in that competition with, um, with a design which was a very, very large umbrella. So in a way it was saying the Reichstag is really important, but in the greater scheme of things, seeking to make a physical forum as a gathering point, it was an incident under a very large energy harvesting roof. So the input of sustainability was there right at the beginning. And then what happened when the realities of reunification really came home, um, the scope of the project diminished. And at that particular point, it was then seen as just the conversion of a building. And, um, and a, a, a lot of people, not just in our team, but I sensed the wider, because being shortlisted down to three architectural practices. And, um, and I remember saying at the time that if, if we hadn't have had the first competition and somebody had said, here's the Reichstag, transform it, then we'd have been really excited. So the first task was, in a way, to reignite a sense of enthusiasm for something that was internally seen as a totally compromised project. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting to work with a group of politicians who had been trained by their very nature, if they were not disagreeing with their fellow politicians, they were not doing their job. So for the first time <laughs> in their careers, they had to agree about something. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, was quite, uh, that was quite challenging. And there were some really quite amusing moments. I mean, we, um, we brought a number of ideas that were uh, considered very, very controversial. Keeping the graffiti, the obscenities, which had been chalked on the fabric by Russian soldiers, or the uh, signs of civic vandalism, um, keeping those and not papering over them. That was a, that was a very real uh, issue of the day. And then um, I remember fighting with colleagues for the concept of the public space at the top of the building and the idea that you could go up there and have a meal or a coffee. And I remember politicians saying, why would anybody ever want to go to the roof? Why would they want to go there for a coffee? And then the first press conference uh, after the building opened was from somebody who said, would the architects please explain why they didn't provide enough space <laughs> on the roof of the building? So it wasn't without its uh, moments. And, um, and I think one very interesting moment was in the interviews for the three shortlisted architects, um, I remember leading and saying to the assembled group of politicians who were charged with making the choice, and they had behind them um, their advisors. So there are a lot of people in the room, probably about 60 people. And I remember saying, and how much does it cost to run your house? And they all thought I was talking about their homes. And I corrected them and said, no, this is your house. How much does it cost you, do you think, to, to run? And there were a lot of hurried exchanges. And I said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you. And you, know, you 
are leading the nation, you set the standards. And here's what you could do. You could reduce your carbon emissions, you could save money, but you would have to invest. You would have to invest in renewables. And it could be a manifesto, and you could set the standards. So um, there were quite interesting asides. The green uh, agenda, in the end, was something that was born out of working, working together. But it did start in a very competitive environment. That's a word that seems to keep <laughs> repeating itself here. Lord Foster, you very deftly and diplomatically established that Brian Roberts is the beau ideal of the good client. I want to ask you, what are the hallmarks of a bad client? <laughs> That's a very easy one to answer. Um, the worst clients, um, in the end, give an overly onerous task to the architects. The worst clients are individuals, hugely well-intentioned, who will start a project and you'll have a real dialogue and there will be a great feeling of togetherness. And then they will gradually disappear. New faces will come on and they will start to question what their colleagues have done. And you can get to the point where you have the opening of a building and you're with the third administration. And, um, and there is no connection between the earlier idealism and it is really left to the architects and everybody around with the best intentions in the world to somehow keep that continuity of endeavor. But you know that the people who might be the third or fourth generation that you're working with totally lost connection with those who initiated the project and don't necessarily share the values, don't even have a sympathy with the building that they're responsible for, um, for steering on behalf of the original client. And you speak from sad experience in describing that. Uh, a question that clearly comes from a, a colleague in your craft. Um, you use natural light, you talked a lot about your use of natural light um, to be both practical, playful, and inspiring in your buildings. This question is, how do you feel about artificial light? When you have to use it, um, what role does it play? Should it, do you try to make it feel like natural light, or does it have another role? Um, I think that there are two aspects of that in the sense that sometimes you can create greater theatricality in certain kinds of spaces which benefit from the power of shade and darkness and the artificial lighting can bring sparkle and, um, and in a way in that yin yang can then make you perhaps in other parts of the building where it's more appropriate to have uh, natural light. So I'm, um, I'm not really the kind of marketing sales force for natural light with, with everything. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, although uh, I'm fascinated by the potential to create light chimneys which will funnel light down deep in cross-section in a building or deep horizontally, um, the reality is that there will always be spaces where you, uh, for one valid reason or another, not be able to permeate them with natural light. And, um, and working with Osram in Munich on the Lembach House, we have pioneered uh, lighting, uh, artificial lighting, which you would swear is, is natural lighting. So, um, so I think it is, it is possible to, uh, um, to create the illusion of natural light. And I think that is a relatively recent and mm -hmm. kind of one-off, but I think has great potential for the, for the future. So our question is, we near the end that goes back to the beginning of your talk. I request that you talk a little bit more about Paul Rudolph, uh, how he affected you, what you learned from him, what kind of man he was. Um, I think that uh, there are a number of, of American architects, Saarinen, individuals like 
Buckminster Fuller, and I would include Paul Rudolph, um, who, uh, who were, I mean, extraordinary, powerful architects. And, uh, and in the case of Rudolph, an inspirational uh, teacher. And, um, and he, I think, pushed the limits of students. He certainly pushed me to my limits, um, uh, but very much in the cause of getting the absolute best uh, performance. And um, I think everybody has their anecdotes about Paul Rudolph, his ability uh, to set a six-week program and then uh, at the beginning of the sixth week to call a kind of snap uh, crit and to demolish every project in the room. <laughs> uh, and everybody was, you know, is starting again time and there are five days left. Um, uh, but um, I never felt that he did that out of, uh, out of malice or with some kind of sadistic instinct, quite the reverse. I think it was his way of getting the absolute best out of everybody. Some people, I think, resented that. Some people have gone on record as decrying it. For me, um, it was a great learning experience. And, um, and in many ways, the present studio has some of the aspects of an academic institution. It's, um, it's taken for granted if, if you join the practice. You are, in a way, starting again, in the same way that it was taken for granted with Rudolf and his class, that you were um, making a fresh start. And um, for me, that was great. So. You spoke of uh, wanting to uh, pierce or uh, surmount an artificial barrier between manufacture and art, some acts of commerce and, and action. It was art. really a protest against, um, um, in some quarters, a current fashion, which sees the role of the designer as designing and then somehow giving it to others to make it work. I, I, I find that arrogant and, in a way, um, to miss out on the extraordinary opportunity of understanding what makes things work. And that's not just the manufacturing process, although I think there is a nobility in making things. And, um, and that is, is, again, for me, inspirational, because the people who make the best thing, whether it's um, in Apple very recently, moving, reinforcing rods, along the surface of the concrete bed to put the next level in. I mean, those are heroic individuals. They're highly specialized. They have a great pride in their work. And when you talk to them, um, their, their kind of honor of being part of that, that project is this tangible. So it, whether it's understanding below the surface, having a curiosity of what makes one company different from another? What are the ethics, the values of an, of an institution? How can those be embodied in a, in, in a design to improve or to regenerate that institution? And, um, and the limitations of materials and the potential for materials. For me, there's a poetry in, in those processes. I don't find it a dirty place out there with, you know, I mean, it's, it's, for me, that's truly noble. Lord Foster, you've been very generous with your time and your wisdom. I see that the human gong has arrived on the stage over there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Foster, for your uh, insightful and inspirational words to us tonight. I'm Jim Rowe. I'm the president of the AIA Philadelphia chapter. And uh, with me here is Ann Papa George, one of our esteemed board members uh, for the Center of Architecture, who is also the Vice President for Facilities and Real Estate Services here at Penn. And we would like to present you with a memento so you might remember this evening in your central role in, in it. Um, on behalf of the Philadelphia Center for Architecture and AIA Philadelphia, we are pleased to present you with the 2015 
Louis wow. Icahn Memorial Award in honor of your distinguished achievements as an architect and for contributing to the story legacy of Khan with your presentation this evening. Congratulations, Lord Foster. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say it's a great honor. I'm very moved, and I don't know whether it's by coincidence or design, but it is the image that I started with earlier this evening. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Extraordinary. Please go ahead. Johnson, I'm the executive director of AIA Philadelphia and the Center for Architecture. Um, this night has been months of work, and I really want to uh, acknowledge our committee chair, Bill McDowell, for all your tireless work, Bill. Thank you so very much. And to David Bender, our associate director of the Center for Architecture. Um, and one more time, our sponsors, because they were not properly thanked in the beginning, Comcast, Liberty Property Trust, Clemens Constructions, Diener Br Brick Company, Jacobs Global Building Design, Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, Pell Trackman, Logan, Carl, and Lombardo, L.F. Driscoll, Neubauer Family Foundation, and last but not least, our media partner, WHYY. Thank you very much for coming. Have a blessed good night. Thank you.